Hello and welcome to another episode of Poetic Just Us. I'm your host Tara and we're here again with the NAACP Chicago West Side Branch. Today we have a special guest, my homie, a uh, former co-worker, Zoraima is here with a special presentation on an organization she recently started. So before we get started in talking about your organization, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what was your inspiration? Yeah, um, well, growing up, I feel like I always had a passion for nonprofits and for charities and, and making a difference uh, as much as I can. Um, and I always had that because my mother um, is the one that implemented all of those values in me of kindness and love and giving back and change. So I named the organization after her, Anna's Heart. And I wanted the organization to do for high school students mm -hmm. what I needed done for me. Um, even though I've achieved a lot, mm -hmm. I could have achieved more. Um, but I feel like my potential was always thrown to the side because I was so young. Um, and ageism is a thing. Right. And so when you always treat youth as as though they're not capable then they're going to think to themselves that they're not capable um, so Anna's heart will be assisting high school students in creating their own change and invoking their own change in their communities so Anna's heart and here's some background information on Zoraima Uh, yeah, I completed uh, three years of AmeriCorps service, uh, one year serving as a tutor and a mentor at Phillip Academy High School, and another serving at City Year Chicago's Civic Engagement Team, planning beautification events across the city of Chicago, and one year serving with Public Allies with Tara, um, where, she, where I recruited attorneys and partnered with corporate donors um, to support First Defense Legal Aid's programs. And um, I have experience serving as uh, an AmeriCorps, serving as an AmeriCorps member has really contributed to my giving back mindset that my mom had planted the foundation for. Um, so I also helped launch First Defense Legal Aid's in-house social enterprise call center and um, I have a lot of experience with volunteer development and fundraising and event planning. So I'm currently the development and partnerships manager at First Defense Legal Aid. Nice. And how do you think those experiences brought you to where you are now? I think they really helped develop my own culture and my own idea of what community or giving back is. Mm -hmm. um, AmeriCorps, especially uh, when I was serving with City or Chicago, they have a very strong culture. And they build that within their members right when you walk in. Um, and so they always try to... They have like these books with these stories that, that help invoke this, this mindset in you where you, you have to really think of what your actions, how your actions impact others. So like open hearts and open minds and moccasins, uh, putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. Um, so all those experiences, they really just planted my brain and just helped that grow inside me. Nice. Okay, and let's talk about the mission statement uh, behind Anna's Heart. Yeah. Um, so Anna's Heart strives to elevate young adults to become future leaders by implementing values of positive change and providing the essential resources to initiate meaningful impact. Um, so this is, we said elevate young adults because young adults don't need to be fixed or corrected or changed. We are just elevating what's already there mm -hmm. um, and helping them become future leaders. Um, the problem with some of the leaders that we have now is that they were educated too late or weren't educated when they were younger. And so they don't understand the individuals around them that they're leading, which doesn't make them the best leaders. Um, and so the goal with Anna's Heart is seeing every student as a potential future leader and implementing the education on cultural competency, competency and social sensitivity to help them grow, to become the leaders that better understand the individuals around them. And then in that way, 10 years from now or five years from now, after the students have 
gone to college or finished college mm -hmm. or have gone straight into just doing projects for their communities, they already acknowledge the individuals around them and yeah. know how to better create change. Yeah. When you say that young people should not be fixed, like mm -hmm. why do you think that is such an issue in society today that young people are trained to, to be to be healed, to be better? Like even with schools, like we'll say we're here to teach the children, but some teachers have the mindset of oh, I'm gonna fix these kids. Like why do you think that's such an issue? Yeah, I mean if you if you're trying to teach a classroom or if you are trying to mentor students, uh, no matter the age, but let's use high school as an example, if you're trying to mentor a ninth grader in high school and you, the way that you describe them to them or around them or to somebody else about them, using the words like, oh, fix, or yeah. they're bad, so we have to make them good, make them better, that puts it in their brain that they are broken. And that puts it in their brain that if I feel like I'm broken, I'm not going to feel like I'm going to be able to succeed. Mm -hmm. I'm not even going to try to succeed. I'm going to put out what others already see in me. And that's, I mean, a huge issue, yeah. <laughs> especially for black and brown students in under-resourced neighborhoods. I mean, all they ever hear on the media is, oh, well, they're not going to go anywhere. They're not amounting to anything. Mm -hmm. All they do is violence or they're in gangs or they're this. If that's all that anybody says about them, that's all that they think that they can be. Absolutely. Um, if you ever heard of the, it's not even an act. He's like an all around like renaissance man. But Wes Moore, uh, he wrote the book called The Other Wes Moore, basically saying that um, he grew up in a, a rough environment, um, but he always had these high expectations set on him. Mm -hmm. And the other Wes Moore grew up in the same environment, similar background, ended up doing life in prison. And then he even went on Oprah. Um, they asked, what was the difference between how you turned out and the other Westmore? How did he turn out? And he said that we both lived to our expectations. He knew that his mom had great dreams for him, but the other Westmore had expectations that were set on him to not do well. So if we mm -hmm. feed our children, our young people, that, like, hey, you're bad, you need some help, you know what? They're going to believe that. They're going to live that and think that's to be true. I think we have a caller. Good, good evening, ladies. You want me to tell you what the deal? Me, you want me to tell you what the deal is? And I can tell you what the real deal. The real deal is when it comes to children of color, and I have said it so many times, and maybe in some people's head it will click. There's some guy looking like Colonel Sanders, and our children are like chickens, and they cut them up and they make money off them. And i give you a good example. Now, I live in Inglewood. There's a school around that used to be called um, Inglewood, and uh, there's another one that used to be Robeson. In terms of goods and services, they have to provide for children that's, that's disadvantaged. There's somebody making money off those children. They make more money off those children in those underperforming schools like they do at uh, Whitney Young. And that's a real deal because because a lot of times it is set up and fail. And i give you another good example. Some people maybe get pissed, but that's the way it is. There's parents that making money off their children not being not doing so well in school. And I give you an example, like an IEP. That if your child is uh, classified as having a learning disability, guess what? You can get a check every month because your child is not meeting certain standards, and, they, and you got parents that are doing all they can to make that money and off the in terms of their children not doing so well. And that's the bottom line a lot of time. Somebody's make every time somebody gets shot or something like that, they wind up being uh, disabled, guess what? It's by at least two hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of terms of goods and services. Every time someone gets shot and get killed in the city of Chicago, guess what? That's five million dollars somehow in terms of in terms of something being bad, it have a five million dollar effect. In other words there's people making money off someone getting killed. Now, that's all I want to say on listen to you ladies' uh, response. Okay. Thank you for calling in. Um, we appreciate you all um, chiming in. Continue to chime in throughout the rest of this uh, session here tonight at 312-738-1060. I do believe that um, crime is a business. 
However, that like, we have to take um, steps in order to alleviate that and to build our own resources in the communities that we live in and serve. So yes, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of resources, you also mentioned that uh, Anna's Heart has programs. Yes. Can you reiterate those programs for us again? So right now we are developing um, full outlines uh, for and curriculums for our programs. Uh, so the first program is Open Hearts, the second is Open Minds, and the third is Heard Voices. So what like what would that mean? Could you like describe each program? Open Hearts, Open Minds. Mm -hmm. um, so Open Hearts is a program that's going to be focused on students creating their own change. Um, I think a back step that some nonprofit organizations have is that they this they decide what the students need mm -hmm. and they decide what the youth in the communities need and they do it for them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an issue because I mean nobody will know what young adults need except for young adults. I mean, we were all young adults at one point, but I mean, we grow up and our point of view and our perspective changes. And so Open Hearts is focused on providing the training and the funds necessary so that students can create their own change. Um, if a student has a passion for anti-bullying or anti-violence and they come to us um, and are a part of our after school program, and they're like, you know what, I need to do a rally at the school. How do mm -hmm. I do this? So we're allowing the students to, well, encouraging the students to go ahead and do that on their own. So that rally will be put on, but and we're not going to say it was put on by Anna's heart. It was put on by that student. Right. Um, so we're going to give them the, the trainings, the skills necessary, um, show them how to event plan and and get everything together, their their networks and their partners in order to make this happen. So that at the end of it, they can look at the, the event or whatever it is that they decided to do and be like, wow, I did that. I did that on my own. I had the capability and the potential to do that. All I needed was the push to support. Um, and that's exactly what we're doing. We're just pushing and supporting and elevating them. And I love how you say that we are, we're inspiring these leaders. So, like, I'm sure you and I both had leadership skills in high school, but if there isn't anyone there to help you to foster those leadership skills, that might never come to being. You might never see those leadership skills actually manifest. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that we need to fix our young people, but we need to, like, inspire them, motivate them. Yes. To see the full picture and to see themselves. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Love it, love it, love it, especially being an educator of teenagers. Like, we know that they are going through this weird time of not quite being an adult, not quite being a kid. Like, it, it's a hard time. It's a hard time for me. But I think what helped me was that I had support, whether that, been, whether that was in the classroom, with my family, with my friends. Support is always needed. Mm -hmm. All right, let's keep it moving. Before the show, um, Zoraima told me about this really cool, um, you know what, I'm going to just let you take it. <laughs> this really cool, what you call it, not even ultimatum, but mm -hmm. something that her job is doing and a group of them are doing to seek change in our, in our city. So I'm going to let you take it away. I think I've already kind of like said too much and you explain. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I work currently work with First Defense Legal Aid, uh, the Development and pa Partnerships Manager there. First Defense Legal Aid is another 501c3 nonprofit organization that's been around since uh, it was founded in 1995 and it became an official 501c3 in 2002, 2003. Um, but basically what we do is try to, well, right now what we're doing is... Uh, we mobilize lawyers and over police community members to fill gaps in public defense mm -hmm. um, and create, engage, and protect in um, protect, create, and engage in replicable alternatives to the criminal system, starting with yes. its entry points. Mm -hmm. So a lot of 
um, violence prevention, pre-arrest diversion mm -hmm. is uh, a main thing. And so a lot of what we did in the past as well is we have a 24-7 hotline. And so when people call that hotline and they were arrested, we would send a volunteer attorney for free to the station to represent them. Um, so what a huge issue is, is you would assume that as, you know, one of your rights getting arrested or being detained is getting a phone call and getting a phone call mm -hmm. as soon as you get arrested maybe is what you would assume um, but that's not the case and a lot of the times people are held in communicado detention so they are held without communication to the outside world without getting mm -hmm. an attorney without communicating with their mom brother sister somebody that can help them mm -hmm. I mean get out of jail um, so that's or get out of being arrested that's that's kind of the issue so what we're doing um, a few of us at FDLA and um, some partners that support FDLA we are taking a plunge we are Literally. freezing for the cause <laughs> <laughs> we will be jumping into Lake Michigan on December 21st at 2 p.m. Um, yes December 21st winter jumping into Lake Michigan at 2 p.m. so it will be freezing um, but we're doing this to raise awareness to incommunicado detention and we'll be jumping into the lake unless a hearing is set on ordinance number 02019-3873 to deem what is reasonable and hopefully deem that everyone is allowed a phone call within the first hour of arrest. Um, that is what we're doing. Uh, you can help by donating at first-defense.org slash donate. Um, each of the jumpers are trying to raise $500 for First Defense Legal Aid and what we do. Um, and if we raise that, um, yeah, we'll be jumping into the lake. Okay. Well, <laughs> be safe. Uh, and just thank you for bringing awareness to this legal issue. Like, I didn't know that was an issue until you brought it up to my attention. So we, I appreciate that and just I, I appreciate you all for doing this, taking the plunge. Um, and I... I hope that you don't have to jump in. I hope that you would, that we find some resolution and that we find the inhumanity of not allowing people their right to make a phone call when they are arrested. Oh, I hope so too, but I will be jumping in regardless because oh, okay. it's going to be proving a point and it's going to keep raising awareness. Um, even though they set a hearing, mm. it's not guaranteed that that's something that's going to be happening. Um, 2020 is the year that we absolutely need to end in communicado detention. So anything drastic that we have to do to bring awareness to that and get as many people involved as possible is important and will be done. Absolutely. Well, you heard it here first. Um, if you want to comment or ask additional questions to follow up, call us now at 312-738-1060. Okay, we have about 10 minutes left of our show before we are wrapping up. As always, you are welcome to our general body meeting. That is two Saturdays from now, December 7th, 1 p.m. at our location, Sankofa, 5820 West Chicago Avenue. Any final words to wrap us up before we conclude? Yes. Um, if there are parents watching or teachers, anybody in the education system, anybody that's working with youth, really, really, truly try to be careful with your words when you are talking to your children or about them and making sure that those words aren't limiting their potential try to refrain from ageism as much as humanly possible. Try not to call your 17 year old um, children a kid. Try not to say, oh, well, you're just a kid, you wouldn't understand. Um, they understand. When we were that age, we understood. And so we know what it is. Um, so just try to refrain from that and, and really use language that's going to encourage their potential and, and inspire them to learn more about themselves and to grow and to elevate into an amazing leader, an amazing adult when they can. Um, 
just please do that. Absolutely, because we all know what it was like growing up. It's a little awkward time for us, especially as teenagers. Yeah. So if it's not loving them, then it's not helping. And even now, as adults, we, we, we all need support. So rally around each other and support and uplift young leaders and current leaders now. All right. Again, this has been another episode of Poetic Just Us. Thank you, Zoraima, for coming in. I appreciate you. I appreciate your effort and all that you are doing. She's just doing great things, y'all. I'm just letting you know. I so, try. <laughs> it's a blessing that she is here with us, okay? This yes. is like an awesome woman. Thank you all for tuning in as well. Have a blessed night, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.